Okay, so we can now finally turn to on the incarnation. If you go back to the first quotation in the sheet, in fact, all we've done so far is looked at the first three words. Yeah? In what preceded. Okay, we spent the whole first hour just kind of looking at in what preceded. Now we can go to the, the text itself. So turn to page three on the quotation sheet. Or if you've got the book, uh, the first paragraph of On the Incarnation. Um, so in what preceded, dot, 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 we, we, did, we did all of that, about the idols, everything, idols and so on. So the first quotation under On the Incarnation, quotation number seven, On the Incarnation one, it says what we'll do next. Well then, my friend, let us next with pious reverence tell of the Incarnation and expound his divine manifestation to us. Okay, what's he talking about? Is he talking about incarnation as we understand it? How he was born of Mary? Is he even doing that? Which the Jews slander and the Greeks mock. Yeah, what do the Jews slander and the Greeks mock? The cross. So is he taking the words that Paul uses for the scandal of the cross and applying it to what we think of the incarnation? Has he turned the scandal of the crucifixion into the scandal of the incarnation? Or is he understanding his incarnation and manifestation to us in terms of the crucifixion? Hmm. Which is it? <laughs> right. Because does he, does he even know what we think 20, uh, 15 centuries later? No. So we're going to have to get his understanding of these words from how he uses them. Yeah? So before you... Re this is the first work called On the Incarnation. In order to understand what he's talking about, you've got to look at how he uses the term incarnation. Don't presume it means what you think it already means. Yeah? So really, it's as simple as that. Don't, don't fill it in with content before you've read what he says about it. So if he says, we're next going to talk about the incarnation of the word and his divine manifestation, which the Jews slander and the Greeks mock. Well, we know what the Jews slander and the Greeks mock. He's, he's alluding to Paul, Corinthians, yeah? And that's talking specifically about the crucifixion. And we've also seen from what preceded this that the whole of this bipartite work is understood to be an apology for the cross. Yeah? That the one on the cross is the word of God, therefore the Christian faith is not our logos. So, what's going on here? Uh, which the Jews slander, the Greeks mock, but which we ourselves adore. So that, from the apparent degradation of the word, what's the apparent degradation of the word? Is it a, a divine word becoming a human being? Okay. That's kind of, uh, and it's only apparent, it's not, you know, it's, it's not, if you apply your mind, it's not really apparent. You may have ever greater and more stronger piety towards him. For the more he's mocked by unbelievers, the greater witness he pr provides of his divinity. Because what men cannot understand as impossible, he shows to be possible. What men mock as unsuitable, by his goodness, he renders suitable. What men explain away and mock as human, by his power he shows to be divine, overthrowing the illusion of idol by his apparent degradation through the cross, persuading those who mock and not to believe, uh, not believe, do not believe, to recognize his divinity and power. So it's not, you know, the kenosis of the degradation of the divine person becoming human. There's no degradation in that. What he's talking about is Philippians 2, the kenosis, which is the kenosis leading to the cross. And the more, he's, the more he's apparently abased in this way, the more that people mock and laugh at all of this, the greater witness he provides of his divinity. Yeah? And just think about the movement of the Gospels. Always go back to the Gospels and think about in the Gospels. When do the disciples know who he is. Do they know while they're following him around, doing various, him doing various miracles? Do they, do they know, they, they, they're following him around for three years and so on, uh, they've heard everything his mother's got to say. On the basis of that, do they know who he is? They see him working miracles, they see him transfigured on the mountain, they see him doing all these different things. Do they know who he is? 
When they see him on the cross, do they know who he is? When they see the empty tomb, do they know who he is? When they see the risen Lord, do they know who he is? <laughs> so what are we talking about in all of this? Yeah? The, the point about resurrection is really important. We're going to come back to it when he comes into it a little bit later. Um, what, so it's opening the scripture. Every, every encounter with Christ is always some turning point by which they come to know who he is. On the road to Emmaus, it's opening of scriptures, breaking of the bread. On the other encounters with the Lord, it's, it's other things. But there's always some turning point. And it's that turning point that's the essential thing. Okay? But m- even more important, it's only as the crucified and risen one that they know him to be the eternal word of God. Yeah? I always ask my students when we're talking about this, if you had been in Jerusalem in the year 25 AD, having a cup of coffee at Starbucks, and you saw Jesus walking down the street, would you say, oh, there goes the word of God incarnate? <laughs> no, sometimes students put their hand and say, yes, I do, I would. <laughs> and they say, well, you must be demonically possessed. <laughs> Go see the dean of students, because only the demonically possessed know. Yeah? So it's not until after that they know. And as well after, this is the one they're now speaking about, the crucified and risen Lord. Yeah? It's only when we no longer know him in the flesh we can make the statement, he's the word of God become incarnate. But what does incarnation then mean? If we can only say it when we don't know him in the flesh. I'm just wondering, does his mother always know? No. No, it's much more complex than that. We, we could get a whole lot into Mary, but we're just, well, we're, I'm just filling all, all the back, as background for, for this. So his apparent degradation on the cross is a turning point. It's, apparent, it's a degradation. People ran away, the disciples ran away. But as they came to know through the opening of scriptures what was really going on in it, they saw it was only an apparent degradation. Yeah? An apparent humiliation. It's not a real humiliation. In fact, it's, it's his manifestation of glory. This is manifestation of divinity. Strength in weakness. This is the ultimate point of weakness. This becomes the point at which he shows himself to be God. Yeah? That's what it means that this is an apology for the cross. And that's how we should... And, and he's understanding incarnation in that way. I had a question that you might have just answered. Uh, the word that's rendered here is degradation. Is that often translated in, with some other English word? Is it instead of degradation, is it humiliation? Um, no, it's evtelias. It really is it's, it's degradation. Okay. It, it's not kenosis. It's, it's, but but it's, it's, you know, he's being abused. He's being uh, all these different things. And the lowest point is, is all of this. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now, so he starts off again. This is how he starts off. Um, and then he, w- what he does... I was really ambiguous when doing this. If, if you've got the book, you see that I've put subheadings in it. Okay? I'm going to tell you now, whenever you read a translation of patristic text, ignore the subheadings, unless they're mine. Okay? <laughs> <coughs> because the subheadings shape how you read the text. Yeah? And you've got to be very careful about it. So really, you should just ignore the subheadings and look at how the author themselves indicates what they're doing. Always pay attention to what they say they're doing and how they're going to do it and when they're doing it. Okay? So that's why I spent so much time on the introduction to both chapters. He's telling us what he's doing, and it's not what we, we're expecting. Okay? Um, if you just, just jump ahead for a minute to the next page, actually page five, five on your sheet, um, the end of quotation number 12. It ends by saying... This, therefore, is the primary cause of the incarnation of the Saviour. Okay? This, therefore, is the pri- first cause, the proteetia of the incarnation of the Saviour. It carries on, which you don't have on the quotation there. One might also recognise that his gracious advent uh, consistently occurred from the, fo- from the following. So he's telling you that from, from chapter 2, after the introduction, chapter 2 to the end of chapter 10 is his, his account of the first cause of the incarnation. And you can also see it from what follows. Okay? And then what follows carries on from chapter 11 and goes all the way through to 
chapter, end of chapter 19, which is quotation 14 on your sheet, end of chapter 19, where he says, the next step is to recount the end of his life. So he's telling you, you know, we've looked at the first cause, the first rationale of the incarnation. You can also see that it happens from the following, a second account. And then when he's finished that, he says, um, that our next task is to describe the end of his life and activity in the body, to say what death befell his body, especially because this is the chief point of our faith, and absolutely everyone talks about it, in order that you may know that particularly from this, Christ is known to be God and the Son of God. Okay? So he gives two accounts of the rationality of the incarnation, then he turns to the death, then he turns to resurrection, and then he's got a refutation of the Jews and a refutation of the Gentiles, and then he concludes. That's how the work's structured, according to me. But I've just explained why I say that, where he indicates, we've done this, now we've got to do this. Okay. So, from chapter um, 2 onwards, chapter th actually 3 onwards, three, 3 to ten, three to 11, he, he, he gives us an account, a, a rationale for understanding what has happened. Remember, it's all an apology for the cross. Um, why Christ did what he did and how he's done it. And this is where he picks up on the question of idolatry that he developed in Contragentes all the way through uh, the, the book in that. And he repeats many of the things. So uh, we, we, we've got time, I think, to read some of them. So, so quotation number eight, chapter, uh, paragraph three. Okay, De Incarnation, Incarnazione three. The divinely inspired teaching of the faith in Christ teaches that the world did not come into being of its own accord, uh, own accord because it did not lack providence and therefore it was made Neither was it made from pre-existent matter, since God is not weak, but that through the word of God, through the word, God brought the universe, which previously in no way existed, subsisted at all, into, into being from non-existence. As he said through Moses, in the beginning God made heaven and earth, through the most helpful book of the shepherd, first of all believe that God is one, who created and fashioned the universe, brought it from non-existence to being. This Paul too indicates when he says, by faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God, so that the visible was not made of Visible was not made from what is apparent. For God is good, or rather the source of all goodness. And the good does not envy for anything. And because he en envies nothing, its existence, he made everything from nothing through his own word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again, he's talking about creation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, not the pre-incarnate word who later becomes Jesus Christ. Okay? That's mythology. That, you know... Just to put it in a, in a, in a, in a very precise nutshell, just, just to stop thinking about this. We say repeatedly in our hymnography, um, Jesus Christ is born outside of time from the Father, inside of time from the Mother. Various ways like that, yeah? You, you've all heard that kind of language, okay? Does the first happen before the second? <laughs> yeah. If, uh, pe when people say yes, if the first happens before the second, I'll say, how long before? Was he born from the father 5,000 years before being born from the mother? 10,000 years? A million years? You know, it doesn't work like that. Yeah? Um, eternity is timeless, not temporal. What we want to do is to make it quasi-temporal. He's born from the father and then later on did this. And in fact, as soon as you do that, you fall into Nestorianism. You've got, you've, got an, you've got a prosopon for the word of God, you've got a prosopon for Christ, and they're distinct. Okay? The way that Athanasius would do it, You've got the theological statement. Jesus Christ um, is God become man. Okay, Fundamental confession. Jesus Christ is God become man. There's a hierarchy in that, but is it a temporal narrative? Did he go from being God alone to being incarnate? That's exactly the same question I asked earlier, but phrased differently. Yeah? No, Jesus Christ is God, become man. There's a logical priority to the is, but not a temporal priority. A logical priority. He is, and this is what he's done. He's become man. Epistemologically, it's the other way around. You've got the, the, the epistemological priority is with he became man. This is the one we know. And he's the one we say is the word of God. Does that make sense? Precisely. So... Um, Think about all the creeds. 
Yeah? I believe in one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ, who, 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 who's begotten from the Father, who created all the world, and all the rest of it. None of the creeds even mention the word of God. But we tend to substitute it. Yeah? We put that into the creed mentally. I believe in one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ, who as word and then as man. Yeah? No, it's one Lord Jesus Christ who does all of this. In other words, something very problematic has happened in modern theology. We've substituted the very subject of theology. We've gone from the one Lord Jesus Christ to the word of God who later on becomes Jesus Christ. There's a problem in that. That's not wh what Athanasius does. And that's why I'm pointing it out. Yeah, let's just keep, this, he uses a shepherd, it's in the Codex Alexandrinus. Let's, uh, it's 25 to 12, I want to get through the whole of Onky Incarnation. Okay. Um, and always stop me at uh, question time, we've got question time later, we've got, uh, and so on. Unless you're not understanding what I'm saying, it's other questions around the side. Okay. So that's what I'm really emphasising. He made everything from nothing through his word, his own word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he carries on, and having mercy upon the human race among all those creatures on earth, seeing that by the definition of its own existence, it would be unable to persist forever. The amenin, again, persisting forever. Giving the further grace, he created men not simply like the irrational animals upon earth, but made them his own image, giving them a share of the power of his word, so that having, as it were, shadows of the word and being made rational, they might be able to remain in blessedness, living the life of paradise, which is truly that of the holy ones. Furthermore, knowing that men's faculty of free will could turn away either way, he first secured the grace that had been given by imposing a law in a set place. For he brought them into paradise and gave them a law so that if they kept the grace and remained good, they would enjoy the life of paradise without sorrow, pain, and so on. If they transgressed, turned away, became wicked, they would know what it is themselves to endure the natural corruption of death, would no longer live in paradise, but in future dying outside of it would remain in death and corruption. So our question is, where are we going to remain yeah? We're created for this. We're created by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to have, to have communion with God through his word, through contemplation, and he's established the laws that we should remain in paradise, but if we do not there, we'll remain in death outside of paradise. Okay. Um, so he carries on with that, and then he does the kind of things we looked at in Contragentes, where he explores how we gave existence to evil, we brought evil into the world, we created the idols and all the rest of it, and now we are subject to death. So, quotation number nine. We've jumped over ten, uh, eight, paragra eight paragraphs from on the Incarnation to get to... Uh, oh, so let's leave that. Turn to the next page. Rather than jumping all the way, let's go to quotation number six. So, quotation number ten on the Incarnation six. For these reasons, death held greater sway, corruption stood firm against men. The race of men was being destroyed, and the man who was rational had been made in the image was being obliterated, and the work of God was perishing. Okay? Now, it's really interesting how in this work on the Incarnation, and almost all the other work of the Church Fathers, the moment of Incarnation occurs at the last possible moment. The race of men was being destroyed. Man who is rational, be made in the image, was being obliterated. The work of God was perishing. We're right at the last moment. Something had to happen. Yeah? Now that should make us think. Um, it's always at the last moment that God works. Does that mean it was really so bad back in the year 3 BC, 4 BC, 1 BC, much worse than any other time in history, and God had to work then or everything would have been lost? Or is he talking in a different key? Yeah, it's at the last moment God acts. I gave a, a, a for, for the um, Christmas liturgy, the Feast of the Liturgy, we read in the Byzantine tradition, we read um, from Galatians, in the fullness of time God sent forth his son to be born of a woman. Okay? And I, I gave a homily on a few years ago on what does it mean in the fullness of time? Yeah, why in the fullness of time did God send forth his son to be born of a woman? And I you know, asked, when we say in the fullness of time, we tend to think all the preparations we made, the whole of salvation, salvation history has happened, and everything's now ready that Mary could give birth. 
Do you think she thought everything was ready? <laughs> really? Do you think, you know, in the middle of winter she's pregnant, she's got nowhere to go, she's about to give birth? Does it really seem like all preparations have been made? No? So it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean what my children think it means. You know, when they ask me, Papa, can we do this out of the other? And I say, in the fullness of time. <laughs> <laughs> they know, yes, I'd like to, but it's probably not going to happen. Yeah? In the fullness of time means literally at the very end of time. This is when it happens. Okay? Now, actually, every moment in time is the last moment in time. Yeah, we tend to think of time as being a long horizontal line. My grandparents were here. The incarnation was way back here. My grandparents were here. My parents were here. I'm here. My children are here and all the rest of it. But Augustine points out, that's false. That's a delusion. Yeah, there is no past. All we've got is a past in the present. Yeah, I can't show you the past. There was a past, but there is no past. Yeah, all we've got is a past in the present. Yeah, there is no future. All we've got is a future in the present. There will be a future, but there is no future. It's not is yet. That's what makes it future. Yeah, so there is no future. All we've got is a future in the present. And then he points out, well, there's no present either. It's gone. Yeah? So literally, we are at every moment, we're at the end of time. But we delude ourselves by thinking of ourselves being on a really long horizontal line. And we give that line stability. Yeah? And, there, and that makes us feel secure. But actually, that's the biggest delusion altogether. Okay, every moment is the last moment in time. And if you knew that, every moment becomes the moment when God acts. God acts in extremis, at the last moment. Okay? <coughs> um, so that's what's going on here. Yeah? So at the last moment, the, the, the image was being obliterated, the work of God was perishing. And he carries on, quotation number 10, uh, paragraph 6. And these events were at once truly absurd and improper. It would have been absurd that God should lay, having ordained that man would die by death if he transgressed the commandment. And that after transgressing, he would not die, but God's word was made void. That would be absurd. Furthermore, it would have been improper that what had once been created rational and partaken of his word should perish and return again to non-existence. Therefore, since rational creatures were being corrupted and such works were perishing, what should God, who is good, have done? Allow corruption to hold sway over them and death to capture them, but then what need would there have been for them to have been created in the beginning? It's really strong language. He's asking, what need was there for God to have created them in the beginning? Yeah, almost invariably, we would not speak that way today, talk about the need that God has. So that should alert us to what's he saying in this passage. Yeah. He's asking, what should God do? God created us to remain in existence in life, having contemplation with him. We've turned, we're, we're disintegrating, we're dying. The image of God is perishing from the face of the earth. What should God do? What kind of language is that? What kind of language is that? How should you hear it? Should you hear it in the sense of, in 5 BC, God's in heaven scratching his head saying, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? And five years later he said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do this. Is it that kind of language? Is it, is it prospective Language like that, narratival, historiographical type language. God's in heaven wondering what he should do. Is that the way that language is working? And then you have to say, well, if it is, why did it take God so long to figure it out? Yeah, it, it's not that. Remember, the whole point of this work is an apology for the cross. The one on the cross is the word of God. Yeah, never forget that. That's what this work's about. So that's a given. Well, as a given, when he asks, what should God, who is good, do? It's a rhetorical question. This is what he's done. You're asking, why this? Not asking, what, what else could he do? So when he's talking about what need would there be, it's not thinking about God from all eternity, in and of himself, and then asking metaphysical questions like, did God need to create or not? Yeah, the kind of questions that medieval philosophers get into. He's not asking that. He's starting with a given fact. 
the crucifixion, the passion, the resurrection. This is how God has acted, and we're trying to understand why. Why did he do this? What's the rationale of this? Yeah? He's done it, therefore it's necessary. It's a given. Yeah? You can't say it's necessary you know, before creation and thinking about God, and what, but my question would be, well, what God would you be talking about in that case? We're talking about the God who's revealed himself in this way, and we're looking at why we call this one the word of God, and we're looking at the rationality of this. It's the given. Yeah? And that's why he can use this really strong language of necessity. What need would there have been for them to have been created in the beginning, if you're going to let them go? Here's what we're talking about, and we're looking at the rationality of this, and the first exposition he gives is the relationship between death and life. Yeah? He's created us for life, we turned away from it, he's got to bring us back into life, this is how he does it, death by death and all the rest of it, this is, this is what is, he's arguing about. Okay, so the first account of the rationality of the creation is this existential question about life and death. Okay, and so strong is it that he can talk about need in that way. Quotation number 11, he carries on, he carries on in, in, in this way. Since men had become so irrational, the deceit of the evil spirits was casting such a wide shadow everywhere and hiding the knowledge of the true God, what was God to do? Be silent before such things and let men be deceived by demons and then be ignorant of God? But then what need would there have been for man to have been created in the image from the beginning? He should simply be made irrational. Or else having been created rational, he should live the life of irrational creatures. But what need was there at all for him to gain an idea about God from the beginning? For if he's now not worthy to receive it, neither ought it to have been given to him from the beginning. What advantage would there be to God who made him? What glory would he have if men who had been created by him did not honour him but thought that others had made them? So there's an advantage, a need and a benefit to God. There's glory for God in all of this, um, worked out this way. The one on the cross is the very glory of God. Okay. So in these two accounts of why the crucifixion, Okay, so on the incarnation starts off with these two accounts of the crucifixion. The why of the crucifixion, the rationality of the crucifixion. The first one centers upon the question of life and death. From the beginning, God created us for life. We turned away, we lost it, we remain in death. What's God going to do? He's got to restore life. Yeah? In the second one from chapter 11 onwards, we'll get to that in a minute. So that having, having posited the question... We can then turn to quotation number 12. This is, his this is you know, creation, uh, the, ration, the, the predicament, the existential predicament, the divine dilemma, what is God who's going to do good do? This is what he does. Okay, so it's a long passage, but it's really beautiful. And we can, we've got time, just. Okay. So, uh, quotation number 12. For this reason... The incorporeal, incorruptible, and immaterial word of God came to our realm. Not that he was previously distant, for no part of creation is left deprived of him. But he fills the universe, being in union with the Father. But in his philanthropy for us, he condescended to come and be made manifest. For he saw that the rational race was perishing, that death was reigning over them through corruption. He saw that the threat of the transgression was firmly supporting corruption over us, and that it would have been absurd for the law to be dissolved before it's fulfilled. He saw also the impropriety of what had occurred, that the creatures he himself had made should perish, and he saw the excessive wickedness of men, and that they were gradually increasing it against themselves and making it intolerable, and he saw the liability of all men with regard to death. Therefore, having mercy upon our race, and compassion towards our weakness, and descending towards our corruption, not being held by the dominion of death, lest creation perish and the work of the Father for men be in vain. He took for himself a body. Now, pay attention to how the word body is used throughout this passage. Okay? He takes for himself a body, and one not foreign to our own, for he did not wish simply to be in a body, nor did he wish only to appear. If he wished only to appear, he could have made a theophany through some better means. But he took ours, 
And not simply that, but from a pure and unspotted virgin, ignorant of a man, um, a body pure and truly unalloyed by intercourse with men. For he, though powerful and creator of the universe, fashioned for himself in a virgin a body as a temple in which to be known and dwell. And thus, taking a body like ours, since all were liable to the corruption of death and surrendering it to death on behalf of all, he offered it to the Father. And this he did in his loving kindness, in order that as all die in him, the law concerning corruption in men might be abolished. And since its power was concluded in the Lord's body, it would never again have influence over men who are like him. In order that as men have been turned to corruption, he might turn them back again to incorruption, might give them life for death. In that he made his, his body, he made the body his own. And by the grace of the resurrection had rid them of death as his straw from the fire. So the body which is his own is also our body, and it's a body which is made um, through the grace of resurrection incorruptible. Okay, so all of this is held together by the taking of the body. Carry on. The word realized that the corruption of men would not be abolished in any other way except by everyone dying. But the word was not able to die, being immortal, son of the Father. Therefore he took to himself a body which could die, in order that since this participated in the word is above all, it might suffice for death on behalf of all. And because of the word who is dwelling in it, it might remain incorruptible, and so corruption might cease from men by the grace of the resurrection. Therefore, as an offering and a sacrifice free of all spot, he offered to death the body which he had taken to himself, and immediately abolished death from all who are like him by the offering of a like. For since the word is above all, consequently by offering his temple as an instrument of his body as a substitute for all, he fulfilled the debt by his death. And as the incorruptible Son of God was united to all men by, by his body, similar to theirs, he endued all men with incorruption by the promise concerning the resurrection. And now, no longer does the corruption involved in death hold sway over men because of the word who dwelt among them through the one body. Really interesting language. <coughs> the word doesn't just take a body and dwells amongst us as one amongst many. He dwells literally in us through the one body. Yeah, it's in them. It's not with them. It shouldn't be among them. It should be... Uh, in them, the word dwelt entities, in them, through the one body. As then when a king is in some city, dwelt in the house, is against, uh, it dwelt in one of the houses, such a city is then greatly honoured, and no longer does um, the enemy or bandit come against it, but it's rather treated with regard because of the king has taken up residence in one of the houses, so also in the case of the king of all. Since he's come to our realm and has dwelt in a body similar to ours, now every machination of the enemy against men has ceased. The corruption and death which formerly had power over them has been destroyed. The race of men would have perished unless the Lord of all, Saviour of all, the Son of God had truly come and put an end to death. And so on and so on. Um, this, therefore, is the primary cause of the incarnation of our Saviour. So the first account of the incarnation in on the incarnation is specifically focused on the question of life and death. He takes a body from the virgin that he might offer it to death, dying on behalf of all, so that he might dwell in all through the one body. That's what he means by incarnation. Yeah? He's not doing a treatise on how Jesus was born and the mechanics of Mary's womb. This, it's simply not. It takes a body from a virgin to dwell in it through the, to dwell in us through the one body, offering his body to death on behalf of all the body which is like ours, and so on. Okay, that's his first account. The first account is centered upon the dilemma of um, uh, existential dilemma of life and death, and then he goes through the whole thing again and does it in terms of the dilemma of knowledge. So instead of starting off, this is, this is chapter 11 onwards, having finished, you know, one can also, this is the first course of the incarnation, one can also see it from this. Okay? And he goes through the whole thing again. We were, it's not on your sheet, uh, some of them it, it is, um, the rest of it's obviously in the book. So he goes through the whole thing again. We were created at the beginning in order to have knowledge of God. And now it's a focus on knowledge, not on life. We're created to have knowledge of God through the word. We've turned towards that which is non-existence. We've fallen into ignorance. What is God to do? Yes, it's a, it's a divine dilemma again. 
the divine dilemma is reiterated, but this time in the category of epistemology, knowledge. Not life and death, but knowledge. Okay? Um, carries on, does all of that, and we get to quotation number 13 on your sheet. Okay? Regarding the death, quickly, yeah. whom to whom? He doesn't answer that question. The only reason I put it there, because he uses that language. He doesn't answer the question, though. Okay? It's, it's not concerned. <laughs> By the time you get to Gregor of Nyssa, the late 4th century becomes an issue of controversy. Uh, origin in some ways, but, but that's, not, that's not what he's dealing with here. He's, he's, he's dealing with an apology for the cross. Yeah? And then substitute. Uh, yeah, I know. He does use all this language. Okay? Um, you often get the idea that, you know, um, the Eastern Orthodox are focused on one way of understanding all of this, and the West is not. But actually, both languages are there in the scripture, and both languages are there in Athanasius on the Incarnation. Yeah. It's literally, it's not the, 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 the dominant note, however, is not debt substitution. The dominant note is becoming one body. Yeah, absolutely clearly, one body, yeah? Um, and it's a life and death struggle. What's at issue is life and death. But it's a one body thing. The whole thing's incarnation. Okay, so, by, uh, so from chapter 11 onwards, we turn to the same, we turn to the, uh, a reiterated instance of the divine dilemma, but now looking epistemologically. Okay, we are created for knowledge of God, we turned our minds towards that which is not, and we've, we've sunk in ignorance. So, quotation number 13. Since men's reason had descended to sensible, perceptible things, sense means through sense perception, the word submitted to being revealed through a body in order that he might bring men to himself as a man and turn their senses to him, and that thenceforth, although they saw him as a man, he might persuade them through the works that he did that he was not merely a man but God and the word and wisdom of the true God. It's a really profound statement. He's saying, we've turned our attention to physical objects. From the beginning... Uh, Maximus confesses, it says, amatogenesthe, together with coming into being, we've turned our minds towards physical perception. Yeah? Our minds which are created for the enjoyment of God, the first thing we do when we open our eyes as a newborn baby, as a newly created Adam, we say, what a beautiful world. Yeah? And we're caught by the beauty of physical things. And then we fall into just seeing sense perception. So that's where our minds are directed... So the d dilemma God faces is, how is he going to get our attention? Yeah, we did the life and death dilemma, but now it's a question of knowledge. How is he going to gain our attention? Well, he's got to take a body. Yeah? If our minds are, are focused on material things of sense perception, he's got to take a body to grab our attention. But if we just look at him as embodied, what do we see? Just a man. Just a man. Yeah? But at least he's got our attention now. Okay? So he says, um, that thenceforth, although they saw him as a man, he might persuade them through the works he did that he was not merely a man but God. It's by what he does, not by seeing him physically, six foot tall, five foot tall, whatever, that we see the word of God. Not at all. Going back to the thing I said earlier, if you'd been in Jerusalem, would you have said, oh, there goes the word of God? No. Yeah? By the works he does, we start to ask, well, what kind of man is it that can do this? Calm the seas, raise the dead, forgive sins, and all the rest of it. What kind of man is it that can do this? And ultimately, the paradigmatic work, the turning point of his work is what? The cross. Yeah? And so it's from the base of the cross that we can say, no, he's not simply a man, he's a man who is God. Um, which is why he does the life and death thing first, and then he turns to the epistemology. Just like with the Gospels, the disciples don't get it till the cross, life and death, and then they can go back and say, oh yeah, now we get it. This is who he was, this is what he did, this is why he did it, and whatever else it might be. Yeah? So by having these two analyses of why this work, in this order, he's actually following the proclamation of the gospel itself. Okay? 
So we no longer know him simply as a man. We know that he's not merely a man, but a man who's God from the basis of his work. And that's the whole basis of the palamite distinction between essence and energies. It's by what he does that we know him. Yeah? Uh, who he is. So he carries on. Um, this Paul wished to indicate when he said, be firm, grounded in the love that you may be able to understand with all the saints what is the breadth, height, length, depth, that you may know the love of Christ which transcends knowledge in order that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. For the world spread himself above, everywhere, above and below, the depth and the breadth, above in creation, below in the incarnation, depth in hell and breadth in the world. Everything is filled with the knowledge of God. For this reason, not as soon as he came did he complete the sacrifice on behalf of all and deliver his body to death, and resurrecting it, making himself thereby invisible. God is invisible. If he's resurrected, we don't see him, Athanasius says. We'll come to the resurrection in a minute. By means of it, his body, he rendered himself visible, remaining in it and completing such works and giving such signs as made him known to be no longer a man, but God the Word. He's no longer a man, he's God the Word. And so he continues, in, For in two ways our Saviour had compassion through the Incarnation. He rid us of death, that's what we looked at first, and renewed us. And also, although he's invisible and indiscernible, yet by his works he revealed and made himself known to be the Son of God and the Word of the Father, leader and king of the universe. Okay? So it's very precise about telling you what he's done and how he's done it and why he's done it. Two ways in which he makes himself known. By the cross, life and death, that divine dilemma, and then through the body to grab our attention with a physical object, but not staying at that because we'd only see him as a man if we see that. Okay. He carries on for a little bit and we get to quotation number 14 where he changes these two di divine dilemmas. So at the end of, uh, on the incarnation 19, he concludes all of this and he says, nor did he cause creation itself to be silent, but what is most amazing, even at his death, or rather the victory over death, I mean the cross, the whole of creation was confessing that he who was known and suffered in the body was not simply a man, but the Son of God and Saviour of all. Again, the order of identification. He who was known and suffered in the body. We're talking about the one who suffered in the body. This one is the Son of God and Saviour of all. It's always that order of identification. For the sun turned back, the earth shook, the mountains were rent, all were terrified. And these things showed that Christ, who was on the cross, is God. Again, the order of identification. The Christ on the cross is God. And the whole of creation is his handmaid, witnessing in fear to the parousia of her master. The cross is the parousia of the Lord. This is where he comes, according to this. So in this way, God the Word revealed himself to men through his works. And then he carries on. The next task is to describe the end of his life and activity in the body and to say what death befell his body because this is the chief point of our faith, to kephali on tis pistiosimon, and absolutely everyone talks about it in order that you may know that particularly from this, Christ is known to be God and the Son of God. Okay. So, we've done this di divine dilemma, the rash two different rationales for the crucifixion. He now turns to why Christ died in this way. Then he turns to the resurrection, then the refutation of the Jews, the refutation of the Gentiles, concludes. This is what the work is doing. Um, we're going to skip over his treatment of his death, because, I want to, because we're already past time, but I want to, f I want to finish off with very particular... See, he goes through a number of chapters on, on asking, why did Christ have to die this way? Would he have died from old age had he not been put to death? Could he have got sick and died in a corner? You're shaking your head. <laughs> um, Richard Hansen, who I quoted earlier, says, uh, referring to Christ's discussion about why Christ should have died on the cross, he says, it presents a series of puerile reasons unworthy of the rest of the treatise. 
and then concludes, the fact is that his doctrine of the incarnation has almost swallowed up any doctrine of the atonement, has made it unnecessary. You know, so much idea of what the incarnation is, God became man that we might become God, why does he need to die on the cross, and so on. Could he have, would he have died had he got sick, whatever else it might be? Yes, it might shake your head, but actually by the time we get to quotation number 17 on your sheet, uh, chapter number 26, he says, no, uh, uh, quotation number 16, quotation number 16, yeah? He says, uh, chapter 25, he says, these preceding remarks are for those who are outside the church. Yeah? So why has he done that? I think he's playing with the reader. How many times have you heard people, or yourself, engage in discussion, would Christ have died had he not died on the cross? Could he have got sick and died? And all the other kind of things. You know, we like discussing counterfactual, hypothetical questions. Would he have died of old age? As soon as we do that, we're no longer talking about the reality that's given. The reality that's given is the crucifixion. And he's exploring that. Yeah? So he's been playing with his readers, you know, seducing them and saying, yeah, would he have died? Would he have got sick? Would he have got fatally sick? And this, that, and the other. And then he slams it and says, this is for those who are outside the church. But, but they, uh, they say this, or they claim that we capitalize on uh, the ignorance of the Jews. Uh, for him to I, he, he, no, he, he's playing with his readers at this point. Yeah? And saying, if you're going to indulge in this kind of discussion, let me, let, me, let me titillate you a little bit. Let, let's let kind of fascinate you. And actually, no, that's a nonsense conversation. Yeah? Because, as we've seen, the whole work is to explore the rationality of the one who died on the cross. That's a given. If you're asking, could it have been in any other way, then you're asking about a different Christ and a different God. Yeah? You're no longer looking at this as the point you're explaining. You're asking a counterfactual, hypothetical type question. Maybe, maybe, maybe. This is, I think, for people who are inside the church. And he's saying, no, that actually is for those who are outside the church. And he carries on, if you want to know, not in a contentious, so back to quotation, if you want to know, not in a contentious spirit, but seeking the truth, why he died in this way, well then listen to this. He, if he came to bear the curse which followed upon us, how could he have become accursed in any other way except by accepting the death which follows on the curse? In other words, if you want to know why he had to die on the cross, look at scripture. As a bronze snake lifted up and all the rest of it. Give us, you know, look at, the, the reality is, this is how he died. Now try and understand what's going on in this. And he's given us two accounts, life and death and knowledge. And if you want to look at the specific form of his death, turn to scripture to understand. Not hypothetical speculation, which, which is what we all want to do. Yeah? Um, so he carries on that way, quotation number 17. He says, so his death on the cross was suitable and fitting and its cause appeared to be eminently reasonable, it was also justified because in no other way except on the cross did a salvation of all have to take place. Again, this language of necessity. Yeah? It's the language of necessity, not as a hypothetical possibility. Did God have to do this? No, it's necessity. He's done it, and therefore you're asking why this? Just like Christ, when opening the scriptures on the road to Emmaus, he showed how Moses and all the prophets spoke about how Christ had to suffer. Because he did. Yeah? We're talking about this given reality. Okay, so that's his treatment of the death of Christ. From chapter 27, he turns to the resurrection. Now what's... And uh, this is what I want to finish with. We'll leave the refutation of the Jews, the refutation of the Gentiles. That's more apologetic and it's kind of a, a structural thing. But it's his treatment of the resurrection which completes what we've been looking at. Now, what's really amazing is that when it comes to treating the resurrection, he doesn't make any reference to the resurrection appearances in the Gospels. Yeah? When we start talking about resurrection, you, know, you can be sure by 
the time we get to Pascha next year, there'll be an article in, in the Time magazine or something, did Christ really rise from the dead? And so on and so on. And was the tomb really empty? Did Christ really rise from the dead? And we'll say, well, well, read the gospel accounts. He really rose. But that's not what he does. He doesn't mention them at all. So what does he do? How does he treat the resurrection? So, question number 18. Yeah, we've just got two pages. Um, that death has been dissolved and that the cross was a victory over it and that it is no longer powerful but truly dead, so death is dead, is demonstrated in no uncertain manner and is clearly credible by the fact that it's despised by all Christ's disciples. And everyone treads it underfoot and no longer fears it. But with the sign of the cross and in the Christian faith, they trample on it as a dead thing. For formerly, before the divine coming of the Saviour occurred, all used to weep for the dead as if they were lost. But now that the Saviour has raised up his body, death no longer occurs to be, uh, no, is no longer to be feared. But all believers in Christ tread on it as something non-existent and would rather die than deny their faith in Christ. For they really know that when they die, they do not perish but live and have become incorruptible through the resurrection. As for the devil, who previously used to exalt wickedly in death, since its pains have been loosed, only he remains truly dead. The proof of this is that before, that, is that before, sorry, is that before men believe in Christ, they view death as fearsome and are terrified at it. But after they come to faith in him and to his teaching, they so despise death that they willingly encounter it. And not only men, but also women prepare for it with ascetic exercises. So death has been conquered and branded by the Saviour on the cross and bound hand and foot, and all Christian passes by, trample on it, bearing witness to Christ, but mocking at death, charging it, saying, what has been written above against it, where is your victory, death, where is your sting, O hell? So the proof of the victory over death is Christian believers. Yeah, we are the proof of his resurrection. Just straightforward, he makes no mention of the resurrection appearance and any other. The fact that he rose from the dead is a fact that Christians believe and are willing to go to their death for it or practice ascetic exercises or whatever else it might be. Ca uh, I'm going to carry on. It's just, just a few chapters, but he expounds this more and more fully. So he says, uh, question number 19. For by nature man is afraid of death and the dissolution of the body. But what is most wonderful is that he who has put on the faith of the cross scorns the thing of nature and is not afraid of death because of Christ. I, I, I chose that line because of the language of putting on the faith of the cross. Yeah? So just like the word puts on the body, we put on the faith of the cross to become his body. Yeah? To become his resurrected body the proof of his resurrection, trampling down death underfoot by taking up the faith, faith of the cross, by robing ourselves with the faith of the cross. Creation number 20 carries on. But if it's by the sign of the cross and by faith in Christ that death is crushed, then it's clear, if truth is a judge, that it's none other than Christ himself who has shown triumphs and victories over death and who's rendered it powerless. And if death was formerly powerful and needs to be feared, therefore needed to be feared, but is now despised after the coming of the Saviour and after the death and resurrection of his body, clearly it's by Christ himself who ascended the cross, again, it's ascended the cross, that death has been destroyed and overcome. Just as the morning sun dispelling the darkness, even so when death has been despised and crushed, since the saving manifestation of the Saviour in the body and his death on the cross, it's clear that he is the Saviour who is also revealed in the body, who destroys death and every day shows victory over it through his disciples. He's the one who every day is showing victory in his disciples. Yeah? We're the instruments of all of this. We're his body. When one sees men who are weak by nature rushing to death without shrinking from its corruption and not fearing descending to hell, 
but with a ready spirit defying it and moved by its torments, but rather preferring for the sake of Christ the zeal for death to this present life, zeal for death to this present life, is it not clear that it's Christ to whom men are bearing witness and who gives and grants each one the victory over death and makes it powerless in each of those who have his faith and wear the sign of the cross? Again, wearing the sign of the cross, becoming his body, being witnesses to his resurrection, he's the one working in us to conquer all of these things. Just a couple of more quotations. Uh, let's just do 21. Um, Christian, uh, pa paragraph 30. So what has been said above is no small proof that death has been destroyed and the cross of the Lord is a victory over it. Okay, so it's not defeat by death, resurrection, able to get out of the grave. The cross is a victory over death. In all, and that's what the whole work has been about. Okay? So everything we said above has been, is no small proof that death has been destroyed. The cross of the Lord is a victory over it. And for those whose minds is, are healthy, the proof of the now immortal resurrection of the body affected by the common saviour of all, Christ the true life, is clearer through these visible events than through any proof through words. For if death has been destroyed, as our argument has shown, and all tread it underfoot for the Lord's sake, all the more did he trample it, uh, on it in his own body and destroy it. But if this proof about the resurrection is not sufficient for anyone, then let him believe the argument through obvious facts. For if anyone dies, he's not able to do anything. When you die, you stop working, you stop acting, you're dead. The grace of action lasts only to one's grave and then ceases. Only to those who are alive belong bodily actions and influences over men. Let him who, see, let him who wishes see and judge and confess the truth from visible facts. For since the Saviour works in the present so many deeds among men, and every day in every place invisibly persuades such a multitude of Greeks and barbarians to turn to faith in him, and, to, and all to obey his teaching. Would anyone still have a doubt in his mind whether the resurrection of the Saviour really occurred and that Christ is alive or that he, rather he is life? Is it the mark of a dead man to spur men's minds so that they deny their father's laws and revere the teaching of Christ? Or how, if he's not acting himself, for that's the mark of a dead man, how did he cause those who are active and alive to cease from their activity? so that the adulterer no longer commits adultery, the murderer no longer kills. And how, if he's not risen but is dead, could he chase away, cast out, and lay low those false gods said to be alive by unbelievers and the demons they worship? Um, for where Christ and his faith are named, thence all idolatry is uprooted, all the deceit of demons is refuted. No demon endures that name, but as soon as he hears it, he takes to flight. This is not the work of a dead man, but rather one who's alive and God. <coughs> Yeah? So it's very emphatic what he's doing. Really, the overarching work is an apology for the cross. He's going to show that the one on the cross is the word of God, therefore the Christian faith is not allogos. Two parts of the work. The first part is how idolatry came to be, how evil came to be, how all of the things that Christ has conquered in his passion, how all of those things came to be. The second part is a corresponding work, how it's conquered and overturned. That work is called on the Incarnation, and it works by having a first two divine dilemmas. The first divine dilemma concerns life and death, and it shows the rationality of the cross, as by death he destroys death, gives life to the one body. The second divine dilemma concerns knowledge. We are created for knowledge of God, but we fell into ignorance, preferring things to the body. He takes a body, brings our minds back to God. Death, resurrection. And in the resurrection, it says nothing about you know, the resurrection appearance of Christ in and of himself. It's all about how we, as his body, show him to be risen and alive by taking up the faith of the cross, trampling down death, doing all the things that we've just seen him describe. Okay? He then continues with the refutation of the Jews, where he says, why don't you believe this? Your scriptures are talking about this all the time, effectively. Refutation of the Gentiles, 
where he goes back to the idolatry part and says, um, actually, look at quotation number 23, the, the last quotation on the sheet there. Uh, it's, it's, he, he argues against the Gentiles, why aren't you believing this as well on your own terms? So, an example, quotation number 23. To mention one proof of the divinity of the Saviour, which is exceedingly wonderful, what man or magician or tyrant or king was ever able to take so, so much upon himself and battle against all idolatry and against all the hosts of demons and all magic and all the wisdom of the Greeks, who are so strong and still amazingly powerful, and at one turn resist them all? Who can do that as our Lord, the true word of God, who has invisibly confuted the errors of each one of them and alone despoils them all, of all men, so that those who worshipped idols now tread them underfoot, those who are under the spell of magic burn their books, and the wise prefer the exegesis of the Gospels to everything else. And I think, if we, if we had more time, I'd spend, like, look at that phrase, the exegesis of the Gospels. I don't think it means reading the Gospels and exegeting them. I think it means the exegesis of the Gospels about this one, done by reading the Scriptures. Yeah, that's, that's, where it's work, that's the level on which it's working. Then he concludes there, for those whom they formerly worship, they abandoned, but the crucified Christ whom they mock, they worship and confess to be God. And, so, and their so-called gods are driven out by the power of the cross, while the crucified Saviour is proclaimed throughout the whole world as God and the Son of God. Again, the crucified Saviour is the one we're talking about in all of this. Yeah? That's chapter 53. It's in chapter 54, he says, he became man that we might become God. Okay? It's not on your sheet. It's a passing comment in chapter 54 as part of the refutation of the Gentiles. It's not the centre of the work. It's not the conclusion of the work. We've looked at the structure of the work and how it's working. Yeah? And yet we reduce the whole work just to this. In other words, we don't read. Okay? As I said at the beginning, what I want to do is to show you what, you know, how to read these texts. Okay, so we go through all of that, and then he concludes with chapter 56 and 57, where he says, what I've given you is, is an elementary sketch and the paradigm of the faith in Christ and his manifestation to us. If you want to know more, use this paradigm as a basis for reflecting, exegeting the scriptures, and you will come to an ever greater knowledge of all of this, and together with an increased learning, you've also got to lead a, a, a godly life, and these are the two things that lead to all of this. That's his conclusion. Okay. So, I would ask you now, but we've got to finish, we've got to have lunch, I would ask you, so what does he mean by incarnation? Okay. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you.